joining on time in the first place. And I would love to know where all of you are from. So if you could just type in your uh, country name or a city name, that would be awesome. Uh, wow, we have people from all across the world, some from Turkey, some from Nepal. Oh, we have, you know, we have people from Pakistan, we have people from different places. I see, uh, hello to everyone. And uh, we have someone from Washington DC, Lagos, Nigeria, Colombo, from Ghana, Tunisia. So we are really going global this year. And you can already see that we have a very wide, uh, you know, uh, people from all across the world joining in. And um, we are working towards the mission to help a million IT professionals to uh, attain, you know, kind of DevOps mastery. And uh, that's what we are here for. So if you resonate with these three things, deep learning, smart tactics, and real skills, if that is what you are into, and if you want to build your career and upscale your career with those three principles, uh, this webinar, this masterclass, uh, and this entire series of masterclasses is for you. Uh, what are you going to learn? Let's set up some context first. Um, this is going to be a two hour session, and we're going to start with a basic understanding of what this series is all about. Uh, the 90 days challenge, Kubernetes Dojo, what this is all about. Uh, some of you are also already paid members. Um, some of you are completely new. Um, and uh, we'll get started. This masterclass series is free for everyone, the live classes and also the labs. And if you want to go further and build projects and do more stuff, we have a membership level I'll explain to you a little later as well. But core topics that we will talk about is today we are here to understand how do you build container images and what is the art of writing the Docker file? And we'll dive deeper into it. Uh, I'll show you how to create an optimal version of a Docker file and an optimal version of an image, really, and how do you go about it as well. In terms of the session context, approximately two hours. The maximum time duration for this webinar, anyways, is set to two hours. So we'll have to wrap it up before that. Um, and um, uh, you can just check the controls. Uh, you'll find everything on all the options on the left hand side, uh, not this side, I think this side out there. I'm getting used to this as well. So on that corner, you'll find uh, the chat, you can post the questions, you can start posting the questions anytime, we'll typically address it towards the end of the session, right? Uh, if I get if you have any immediate question, you can raise the hand and, uh, you know, ask the permission to speak. If possible, we'll allow that as well, right? Um, the replays will be available for about five days. Uh, I will not be monitoring the chat continuously because I'll be focusing on explaining the topic to you. But I'll uh, question and answer, put it in the Q&A section. There is a separate Q&A section out there. So use that as well. Replay will be available to you. It will be emailed to you and it will be available to you for five days if you are a, a non-member. If you are a member, it will be available for a longer time. Um, and make sure you're non-distracted, take notes, participate, um, post questions, we'll address it. You can, you know, put it in the chat. We have a lot of people joining in today, so I may not be able to address every single question in the chat uh, immediately, right? Uh, let's uh, understand this audience as well. I want to know, understand who you are um, in terms of uh, what profile um, you belong to. And let me first put this survey in front of you. And uh, um, I'm gonna do that one more time. Give me one more, uh, one more moment here. Uh, right, I'm resetting it. The reason I'm redoing it is because I want to show you the results at the end of it as well. So what is the profile that best suits you? Are you a DevOps engineer, a developer, an IT fresher, a system administrator, QA, uh, you're a manager leader? who you are. Um, all right. So that's the first question. And uh, we have a mixed audience, it looks like. I will keep this poll for a few more seconds, and then I'll show you the results as well. So here we go. And you can see that we have um, a lot of you are fresh um, ID freshers. Some of you belong to ops background, 20% are developers, approximately. Uh, we have DevOps and SREs as well, some QAs and some managers as well. 
The next question that I want to uh, share with you is here. So are you planning to appear for the Kubernetes certification, namely CKA and CKAD is what we are talking about. Uh, and the reason why I'm asking this is because uh, if that is the case, we will tweak it even further uh, to cater towards the certification programs. We already did that. And this is the reason why we modified the missions. Initially, it was a different set of missions and uh, we modified it to align with CKA, CKAD topics. If you look at the curriculum as well, it has been very well mapped with uh, each week's agenda. What are the CKA goals? What are the CKAD goals uh, that it aligns with? It's all given in the curriculum. You can download this file. I will share this with you. Um, I have shared this file with you. You can download that as well. And as you can see, 88% of the participants here are interested in CKA and CKAD. And if you are, this series is definitely going to help you build that knowledge knowledge base and help you understand uh, the concepts, get started with the topics and uh, possibly practice a little bit. And if you want to take this further, you can always uh, participate in our, um, you know, uh, get access to our projects and courses and stuff with the membership program that I'm going to talk about a little later. Uh, next question I have is how many of you are already members here? And uh, that is what you shall see in front of your screen right now. If you already are a paid member of our community, uh, that is a School of Terms community, either a geek member, nerd member, silver member, um, you can put it in there. Uh, I, I would assume because most of you would have been um, interacting with, would be interacting with me for the first time. Uh, it is safe to assume most of you are, are not members, but I just wanted to get an understanding of the audience here. Uh, so that if you're interested, I will talk about the membership towards the end of it. And in case if you want to take up the offer, there'll be a um, special offer given in the webinar during the session. You can take it up if you uh, want it there, right? Uh, all right. So uh, there are some questions from the members about joining Kubernetes dojos and all that. Um, we will take those questions, uh, but not today, not here. We have the membership call on Thursday. Uh, we're on Zoom, where we'll interact uh, and talk about, uh, take those of us well, right? So um, let's get started with the topics though here. Um, after knowing you, who am I? Uh, since most of you are interacting with me for the first time, uh, my name is Gaurav Shah. I'm a corporate trader. I'm a, a course author. I have authored books as well. I also speak at the events. And apart from that, I'm a family guy, uh, father of two twin boys, and uh, that is the best role I uh, enjoy the most. And they just turn four. Uh, and uh, in terms of my professional stats, in terms of the course author stats, I have published about 25 plus courses with 100 plus students. And that's why my next goal, the mission, is to reach up to about a million uh, professionals across the globe this year and start um, you know, helping them master uh, Kubernetes. These are some of the pictures from my corporate trainings. I uh, train at various organizations across the globe. And uh, these are some of the organizations that have conducted the workshops. And I've delivered close to around 500 uh, plus workshop now uh, on the topic related to DevOps, including infrastructure as a code, cloud, containers, uh, CICD, uh, you know, service meshes and whatnot uh, today, right? So it's all uh, Kubernetes related work. Now, I have authored a book. I have uh, um, I have had many students on Udemy as well. I have created course courses for Linux Foundation. Some of their official courses I created in past. I'm no more a course developer with Linux Foundation, but that's my past work. And I have also been published on edX um, with one of the courses that I did for Linux Foundation. And my mission is to bridge the gap. Uh, between you know people, uh, the organizations not finding the right talent with the real skills, and the people who want to master DevOps skills and upskill in their career. I want to bridge that gap and uh, help people cross that over and build the real skills. And uh, that's what this is all about as well. This masterclass is all about as well. Now let's get to the core topic of the day, and we'll come back to this a little later. So what are we talking about here is uh, uh, why are we here is because, um, you know, this whole series of masterclasses is to help you 
one master, uh, be a Kubernetes expert, build the real skills and become an expert and also prepare for the exams like CKA and CKAD in a very time bound manner. And that's what we are doing here, right? So we have this challenge, which is a very goal focused. So that's our goal, help you, you know, successfully pass the exam and prepare for it. Secondly, also build the real world skills, right? Beyond certification, why are we doing the certification? It's also to build those capabilities. So that's our primary goal. So it's a goal focused, time bound, it's about 90 days uh, program. Uh, practice oriented so you will get access to the labs beyond that you'll get access to the project and membership program and we're creating a holistic program with uh, especially if you are a member uh, you also have access to apart from the live sessions and the labs you will have access to a product library and building 20 plus projects related to ck and ckd there'll probably be more than that like 30 40 50 uh, but and it should be enough for you to uh, build the skills as well as prepare for the exams uh, we already have the courses on Docker and Kubernetes. These are detailed courses. I'll talk about it later. And you get access to courses, group, projects, coaching, certification. We have a couple of certification related to Kubernetes that we internally do as well. And you will also have access to that if you are a member. Uh, I will talk about the membership towards the end of it. And how are we achieving this Kubernetes mastery? How are we trying to reach the goals? Is through these 12 missions, starting with Today's mission being containerization, where you learn about how to write Docker files, how to build container images. And as part of the projects, this week's project, uh, if you are a member, if you are non-member, you will have access to a couple of labs where you'll uh, build a project for a uh, Python application, maybe a C application. If you're a member, we have uh, four more projects for you where you will be building uh, or packaging these microservices, one on Golang, one Node.js, one Spring Boot, one Python. Uh, the second mission is going to be fortification where we'll talk about Kubernetes. That's where we start talking with the core Kubernetes topics. I'll just list the topics for now, not go in depth into it. Uh, but you can look at the curriculum, uh, which I've shared already and uh, look at what are the topics which will be covered that week. And also uh, the how it maps to the CKA and CKAD topics. If you look at the CKA curriculum and CKAD, you will see all of those topics will be covered as part of some session or the other and which session focuses on what topics and how uh, that is the breakdown which is given here right because i go by go with kubernetes topics not just random topics uh, with a list of things that is categorized as for ck ck curriculum but it's a very structured methodical approach that we take uh, towards it right and that's how i have organized it at least the way i organize it is slightly different the third topic is going to be about how do you build scalable uh, self-resilient uh, applications with replica sets, replication controllers. Uh, we are also going to dive deeper into service networking. Very, very important topics related to Kubernetes. If you uh, understand this and this, a lot of troubleshooting also happens here. So how does the load balancing, service discovery, how do applications talk to each other? How do they get exposed? Uh, we talk about that. We'll talk about deployments, rollouts, rollbacks, configuration management, and more controllers during these topics like deployment, uh, persistence is another mission. So missions are actionable. So I just made it fun words out of it. So persistence is about persistent storage. Maybe talk about a bunch of topics related to uh, persistent volume, volume claim, storage classes, CSI, that's the new thing. Uh, we'll talk about security aspects of it like authentication, authorization, admission controllers, uh, network policies, security context, and all of that. Uh, we have one special topic on HEM. Now, HEM, weightage-wise, in terms of exam, the weightage is not so much. But real world, you need to have real knowledge of HEM because that's how you package your application. That's how you deploy it in different environments. So how do you go about doing that? We'll dive deeper into it. Uh, we'll talk about ingress. Again, ingress is the same. May not be, the, it, is, it is part of the CKA, CKD exams. But more than that, it's a very important aspect about how you expose your application, start defining the routing, name-based routing and whatnot. So, and a lot of people struggle there. So we'll spend one week there. Uh, we'll talk about it in a very specific way, explicit deep dive into that. Uh, we'll talk about how do you build production like cluster, mainly using KubeADM because that is exam specific. KubeSpray will be like a bonus if you want to take that. 
And administration wise, how do you uh, set up like, you know, there's a Kubernetes database, how do you back that up, restore, which is a very common task you have to uh, participate in the exam as well. Uh, how do you upgrade the nodes, do the node maintenance, uh, advanced scheduling stuff. And then another bonus topic is Argo Dice. Uh, this is about Argo CD, setting up automated deployments, etc. So those are the 12 missions we are going to embark on uh, the journey to complete those. So it's a mission based, you know, weekly there is a mission, weekly there'll be labs, you attend the master class. So how do you go about it is you attend this class, you complete the labs. If you are a member, you will complete the projects. And that's how you build the mastery, right? And that's how you go about it. Uh, membership part is something that I will talk about a little later. But let's get and dive into this topic of building container images. Let me just look up the chat. Um, all right. So I understand. So some, for some of you, this might hang because uh, um, we have a large volume of participants now. And also, um, a lot of times, this webinar system gets a little flaky, but typically reverts back to normalcy in a few minutes. So just be patient with that. Um, all right. OK, we have people from a lot of different places uh, there. OK, so there is a suggestion about audio. Not great. All right. So we'll figure this out. If there is a problem with the audio, uh, do let me know. Give me the feedback so that we can figure this out. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, I'm just going to quickly check my audio settings as well and just make sure that I'm on the right audio or not. All right, just give me one quick moment. All right, there's no very visible section on checking the audio here. So I'll have to figure this out a little later. Sorry, sorry about that, Suresh. Uh, OK, never mind. We'll go with what is uh, available right now. And uh, let's, uh, let's figure this out a little later. OK, so let's talk about this topic of building um, images. Now, why it is important, let's say you're preparing for CK, CKD. It is not even part of the CK topics, for example. CKD talks about it a little bit, uh, but why it is important and why have we taken it as a first step is because when we talk about Kubernetes, Kubernetes is all about deploying containers at scale. So when we talk about deploying containers at scale, how do we deploy that is where building the image is primarily important because you take the application, package it into a container image, and that's what you're going to deploy with Kubernetes later, right? Now, how do you build those images? And what is the process behind that is what we're trying to understand. And that's what we get started with. The first step towards containerizing your application workloads is to build images, to package them into container images, and then we publish it to the registry. Registry is like a repository of all these images. And then we take it from the registry and deploy it to the Kubernetes cluster. That is why it is important. Now, uh, we will take this use case where we have a Python application. It's a web application. And I will show you how to go about building an image for this application. Now, there are a couple of different approaches towards doing that. Let me bring up my explainer on iPad and I'll start talking about uh, how do we go about it. All right. Now, this is how we go about uh, building the images, right? So there are two different approaches we can take. One is you can build the image manually. Second is using something called as a Docker file. Uh, how many of you have written a Docker file um, anytime? Just type in yes or no, right? Because that way I get an understanding of who knows what. And based on that, we can drive this discussion, right? So if you have written the Docker file anytime, just type in yes. If you haven't, you can uh, type in as no. 
All right, so I see yes, a lot of yeses, that's great. Some, in fact, I see a lot of you have written the Docker file. Some of you haven't, that's fine. Um, so this is a good time to get started with it. So essentially Docker file is how we automate uh, the process of building the container image. So how do you write the Docker file? How do you automate that process in order to understand that you need to understand how the image is built in the first place in manual, manual approach, right? Now, what I'm also assuming here, if you're completely fresh out of the board, on the board, I assume or I, I would request you to go and uh, learn a little bit on containers because we're not covering Docker as specifically here. Um, we're just like, jumping onto the building container images. So foundations about containers, uh, what are containers, uh, how do you get started running containers and operating those? That is a very important knowledge. Uh, if you are interested with a structured course, I'll show you how to get started with a membership, which will give you an access to that. Otherwise, you can learn on your own uh, about containers. How do you, uh, what are containers? How do you run them, operate those? So that you have a foundational knowledge. Considering you have that knowledge and you when you build that knowledge, this topic is what we start with here. So what do we start with? We have this application. Uh, this is a application which is written in Python. We call it as a boat app. It's part of a larger microservices application stack, which is here. This is part of five microservices here. It's just one of the service, one of the front end microservice. This application is written in Python Flask. Python Flask is a framework based on Python. <coughs> and our task here, our mission is to uh, containerize it. How do we go about it is what I'm going to show you. The first approach is to build the image manually. The second approach is using a Docker file. Let me begin with the first approach and explaining that first. Uh, there is a question. I'll take a question. Stop. Pause here and take a couple of questions here. So uh, Navraj has a um, question about what is the difference between Docker and Kubernetes. See, <coughs> sorry. Uh, Docker is a way to run and package a container application. So you can take one application, convert it into a container image and run that just like a virtual machine and a virtual environment. You can run that in a container based environment. It's a very similar thing, but slightly different. That's when I said you'll have to build a little bit of foundation on that, but it's a way to run your application in a contained environment. Just think of it that way or virtual environment, right? That's what Docker allows you to do. Now, what is Kubernetes then? Now you can run one container in one application in one container on one host. Sure, that's what Docker allows you to do. But when you want to take it to the next level, and if you have like hundreds of containers trying to run on, um, let me explain this with a visual representation so that it's easier to understand. So all of these explainers generally go as part of our courses as well. So um, what is Kubernetes then is, and why do you need it? Let me answer that question for you. So let's say with Docker, you took one application. It allows you to run the application in an isolated environment. Like, oh, you have this container and that container running on the same host, but they're in virtual environment of their own. That's what Docker allows you to do. And you can run, let's say, one, two, three containers on a host. That's great. Uh, there is another tool called as Docker Compose, which also allows you to run that multiples and connect them together. But again, you are limited to one single server. Imagine you are running a production environment with hundreds of nodes and thousands of containers to run day in and day out. Now, you're not running it on one host anymore, or you don't want to manage that individual host uh, you know, and uh, think about, oh, this container goes here, that container goes there. Uh, you don't want to make these manual decisions at all. So what do you do? You take all your nodes that you have, convert it into some sort of a cluster. And uh, so you take all the nodes that you have, instead of managing them individually, you connect them together, form a cluster out of it, and that's what you connect with. So that collectively, you look at it as, oh, I have 15 terabytes of memory and 1,000 cores of RAM to submit my workloads to. This is like a supercomputer. And internally, it takes care of 
all of these features like what runs where, that scheduling, uh, then how container on one host connects with container on another host, the networking, that is what we'll dive into at some point of time, uh, networking and port-to-port uh, -port communication, um, scaling, load balancing, service discovery, and a lot of other things, right? And that's what Kubernetes offers. That's what Kubernetes is. So Kubernetes is like, a that's why it is called as an orchestration engine. What does it orchestrate? It orchestrates your containers running across multiple nodes. So it decides where to run what, how, how to connect them, and offers a lot of other things on top of that. Fundamentally, that's the difference between Docker and Kubernetes. All right. Uh, can I get the GitHub link? It's already there. Don't worry about it. The lab that I'm demonstrating here, you will do it later. And there is already a lab guide, which is right here if you get it. So don't worry about doing it right now. Just try to understand it. You also have a replay uh, uh, access to that. So once you understand this, you can anyways follow the lab guide later easily. Don't try to uh, do it right now. Recordings will be available lab guide will be available don't worry about it only the projects are part of membership programs and there's a lot more courses and other stuff but uh, recordings and labs will be uh, available to everyone so it's there okay i'm going back to the topic of building container images and i want to show you two different ways of doing that the first is a manual approach it's important to understand this approach in order to automate it later with docker files Docker file will come later, okay? And if you do not have any background on containers, you must start with that first. Uh, I will show you how a little later. But, um, okay, how do I build images? So let's say this is the code which has been given to us. This is what we begin with. Let me put it all on one side. Uh, this is the application. This is the Python application has, uh, you know, it's all dependencies up there. Um, this is the um, actual code for app.py. This is the actual application written in Python Flask. It's a very simple application, just shows a web interface and allows you to vote um, as well, right? So, all right. So audio is still bad for uh, just taking a, you know, some input. Is it bad for everyone? Uh, you will have access to the recordings again, um, just to repeat. All right, so some people are able to hear clearly. I'm not sure whether it is because of the number of attendees, because this room supports 500, but maybe it is because of that. So if you do not find the audio right, uh, just try refreshing or rejoining the room and see if that works. All right, let's continue. Uh, in the interest of time, let's continue with it. So we're talking about building this container image for this application. And how do we go about it is we have access to the source code. That's what we start with. So what do we do is first step is to clone the code onto our system where Docker is installed, right? Now I'm assuming that you already have Docker installed. The best way to do that is using Docker desktop or on Linux, you can directly install it. The next step is to set up an environment or create an environment because we are running or building a container image. So the environment that you create would be a container as well. And number three is you uh, basically go ahead and uh, copy over the source code, right? Because you will have the environment with either, let's say this is where your build tools will be. So either you pull an image which already has the build tools, or you can start with a fresh image like a vanilla version of Ubuntu or CentOS, and then install your build tools on top of that. My recommendation is typically to pull an image with the build tools already installed. Right, that saves you time, you know, and makes the process also simpler. The next step is to copy the source code. After that, you build the application. Right, so whatever is needed to compile the application, to build it, to 
you know, to in this case, just installing the dependencies. And to run it, you do that at this stage. And then once you have everything ready, you just take a snapshot of that container, which is running container with everything installed into it. And then you commit that into a container image. And that is the manual process, a six step manual process. And later on, I will show you how this can get converted into an actual uh, automation code. Uh, that's what will lead us to the Docker file here. So let me demonstrate this step by step, uh, right from the first step being how uh, do we clone it and then set up the uh, you know environment with it. So I'm going to go ahead. This is my environment where I have Docker installed. Validating that, right? I can see the Docker installed here with the server and client. I have a Linux system where I have installed Docker manually. It's over to Linux. Uh, next step is to clone. So first step is to clone the code. That's what I'm doing now. And this is what I want to pack it. So I go into the directory where the code exists. And then this is a Python application. Okay. I want to build it. So I need an environment for it. Uh, if I were to build a virtual machine image, I would have created the VM. This time I'm building a container image. So now I want to create a container. How do I create a container is where I would go ahead and launch one, you know, using a command such as this, right? Now, what are the things to remember here are, if you look at this, I'm using Docker to run a container. The typical option being hyphen hyphen IDT. I'll give it a name, call it as dev or something like that, right? So my build container. Then the ports, right? Ports, why? Because when you have containers, you uh, and an application running on top of that, you need to be able to access it. There is typically a concept of port mapping. Again, that's part of the fundamental container uh, related concepts, which you should be aware of uh, before starting with this, uh, uh, you know, this particular topic. And then we have an image. Image comes from the registry. What is the registry? Registry is like a GitHub uh, for container images, basically. So if you see GitHub, you have, uh, let's say this is an application repository, right? And this is an application created by me or this organization called as Kaftista slash Kaftista. So something like that, you have images here and I have uh, a repository of images, basically. If I search for MySQL, there are many, this is the official version. And then I have uh, MySQL created by Bitnami. That is MySQL created by Ubuntu. And there could be different versions of it. So if I go to Bitnami MySQL, I see different versions which are defined with different tags. That's how the image repositories are structured. So Bitnami MySQL is an image created by a user called as Bitnami. Or if it is created by Docker, it will just have uh, uh, the name of the application, not the owner or the user because it is an official version of the image. All right, so that's uh, what this is. All right, so code is not visible. Um, let me switch myself here. Is that better? Okay, again, I'm learning. This is the first masterclass I'm doing here this time. So with the demos and stuff. So let me know if there is anything I can improve on. All right. Okay, so what am I doing now is I'm running a container, I'm launching a container with this port being exposed with this image called as Python. Where does it come from? It comes from here. This is the image. And it has a tag. A specific version of that is here. Uh, we'll talk about this Alpine. Alpine is a small scale version of uh, distribution of a Linux. It has a significance while building the images. When we talk about optimizing the images, I'll specifically mention it and show you how much of a difference would it make over using something like Ubuntu or uh, CentOS and so on. So I'm launching. So basically, I'm create, I've created a container environment, right? It 
has the built tools in this case python and it comes with a python package installer called as pip which is here okay this is the package installer for python okay uh, now it comes built into this image along with python and there's a base alpine version of it and with that i have created this container which i can see here now running the name of the container is this the port mapping will come into handy later when i have the application packaged and uh, this is the base image right and uh, let me go ahead and then step number three is to copy over my source code into this container right so i will copy over the source code into this container using docker cp i already have the source code cloned onto my system where i've cloned it here as my step number one and i'm using docker cp to copy everything into this container whose name is dev or i can use the container id and then i'll copy it to a specific path uh, i think it's called as a slash app just reference my lab guide right dev is the name of the container here that has been created that's a reference and slash app is the path if it is not available it will get created automatically all right so i've copied over the source code now and now i will switch into that container i'll get here and then i'll start building it from right here okay and then uh, what do you build, mean by building an application? This it depends and this is relative to the application. Some applications are compiled like Java. So there will have uh, you know, uh, some compiler running it or Maven build something like that, right? Or Gradle, Maven, some build tool. Uh, C will be C compiler and you compile the application, run make, make all, make install, something like that. In case of Python, which is an interpreted application, uh, it is more about just installing the dependencies. So to do the next thing, I will get inside the container. Right now I'm on a host, I'm inside the container already, I believe, or not, okay. I'm connecting back, looking at, all right, I should have looked at that. Okay, I'm on the VM where the container is running. And uh, now I will get inside the container. Again, exec is a command you should be aware of in order to understand this. So all of these foundational topics I typically cover in my Docker course as well, or you should learn about how to run operate containers uh, before you start packaging it, right? So we're jumping a little bit because we have only 12 weeks to go. So uh, that's why we, uh, I think I'll make this as a prerequisite from next time onward. So Docker exec hyphen IP this and uh, I'm connecting to a container whose name is this and getting inside that. And once I'm in it, I have copied the source code as the step number uh, three. I'm now building the application. In this case, this is a Python application. How do you build a particular application? Depends. If it is node application, you say in the npm install and npm build. If it is Python, you will say pip install. Uh, if it is Java application, it will be Maven compile or Maven package. So in this case, it is about just running a pip command, which looks up the requirements of txt. So I'll get in the directory where the source code is on the container. This is where my requirements start. requirement is the dependencies. And now I'll start building using Docker, uh, not Docker, I'm inside the container. I'm using pip to install the packages which are provided in the requirement of TXT, which means it's just going to go and install these and their dependencies. That's what this is doing now. And that's what you see happening here. Some of these packages are not listed here because they are installed as part of the prerequisite or dependencies. Now the application is built. How do I run it or test it? That's my next step to test run the application and see if it is really working or not. Uh, how do I do that? Again, is for this application, it uses a web server called as Unicorn. 
and you have to launch it this way and you can also bind it to a particular port uh, which is what i've mapped like it, i'm launching this application on port 80 and i've mapped it to a particular port let me show you which So it has been mapped to 8000 port on this source. This is a cloud server. I run it on digital auction. So I will find out the IP address of my host and connect to it. I will leave this one and uh, 8000 port. I should see the application come up if this is the right uh, I think this is the internal IP there is an external IP also should be yeah yeah sorry Seems like running. Map to 8000 port. Yeah, it has come up. All right. So uh, this is the same one. If I stop this service, that should go away. You should see if I refresh, it doesn't work. If I launch it again, running on the same port, if I refresh, it does work. So this is the application. This is the mode application and uh, see some options, I can click on it and so on. It may not work because there are no backing services here, but you do see the front end. That is what this vote application is all about. And as far as we are concerned, this is running fine. So we, are, we can go ahead and package it into an image if we want at this point of time. How would we do that is we can take all the changes which have been made to this container, which has the build tools, which got the source code as well copied and then I built it here so it, is, it has all the prerequisite to run it as well so everything is there and I can just package it into an image and uh, use that as well if I wanted to do that I would come out of the container of course because I want to take the container and commit it so I'll have to be on the shell where I launched it from and I can say docker container commit and I'll take this container and say this is my image for this vote application with version one. So this is my user ID on Docker Hub. So init cron, uh, just to tell you the story, was the name of my blog, which I started in 2019. It exists no more. It was a WordPress blog. And that became the name of my company as well. And I still use that as my user ID, even on GitHub. All right, and it comes from the init, and uh, init was the de facto, you know, uh, run, run process, the initial process, and cron is about the time. So being there first, being at the right time, at the right place, that's what the init cron was all about for me. Now, this is the image, and uh, this is the repository. I want to publish it to, let's say, right? Now, uh, if you look at the last published was a month ago and so on, uh, I can publish it now. So if I can create an image, so I'm committing the changes that I've made to the container into my own image with version one. This is my repository. This is the image uh, tag. And that's what I can publish to this registry. Okay. Okay, I'm not... I'm getting back to the git push origin. So it's more about Docker image push and the image ID. And uh, it says uh, access denied. Why? Because of course I need to log in here. Uh, provide the authentication data. So I'll say Docker login from this command line. And once I'm logged in, I can try again. And it does publish the image. 
with the layers that it has okay uh, the concept of layering is something you must understand in order to, in order to understand how containers work how the images are created because i will be talking about concept of layering if you do not have that background uh, you'll have to go back and learn that a little bit as well right uh, it's important concept here so v1 is the one i just published you can see that here this is my first version of the image and this is what i built manually using this approach now how can i automate this process is where i can instead of doing this manually manually is error prone cannot be kind of repeated many times you have to go and do that manually uh, it's an imperative approach so what is a better approach you convert this procedure into a code and that code that file is what we will call as the docker file so what is a docker file it's just a process converted into this set of instructions uh, how does the docker file for this would look like i will show you the docker file first then we'll dive into it and then i'll show you a few more concepts related to it right how do you write one and all that so this docker file uh, if you look at it i'll use this and show you how to build an image with a docker file that's my approach number two so you go to the workstation where the code is go to the repository where you have chucked it out and uh, create a file by name docker file with only d capital if you look at this docker file just observe it for a moment and then you should be able to figure out what's going on here All right, just for the people who have questions about uh, recordings, you will get the recordings after the class and we will figure out how to make this better next time. Or we'll start streaming it to something like YouTube, which might be a better option if that is the better option. We'll figure it out, okay? Uh, this is the first time we are kind of doing it at a slightly larger scale. We were planning to do it at a much larger scale from now. Uh, so if YouTube works better, we might go that way as well. Okay, so just bear with me for the first masterclass. I'll take all this feedback and we'll figure it out for the next one. Now, talking about this uh, set of instructions right here, right so um if you look at it it's quite clear what's happening here so we started with this image uh, there is a work to it we'll talk about this something is being copied what that is we'll figure out uh, then the same command is run here pip install expose ad is the port configuration and we have this unicorn app colon app minus v something uh, which launches the uh let's say our um application as well right now what is happening here how does this work uh we'll just look at this as well right so how do we use it in the first place right so i have this docker file now how do i build an image with docker file is what i'll uh, demonstrate first so we take this docker file right and convert it into or uh, provide it to the docker image build process out comes the image which contains everything that we uh, need and uh, everything packaged into it basically right so that's uh, uh, what happens here so how do we do that is using docker image build hyphen t and then we provide uh, the tag which is nothing but my user id application name version and path to the docker file so docker image build hyphen d path to the docker file you can see that here and uh, this does a similar thing it's just doing it in an automated way it pulls the you know base image it you know goes inside it copies the code uh, compiles it or runs whatever is needed like pip install here and packages into an image with a specific version as well that is version v2 now <coughs> uh, 
let's have a look at the images now. So Docker image ls shows me a list of images and I have my version one and version two here. If you look at the size, not much of a difference here, right? In terms of the size. So, uh, all right. And uh, what is the real difference? We'll figure it out by looking at Docker image history. By the way, I'll just start watching the chat um, a little later because I need to focus on explaining this. Um, also, if there are any questions um, which are not specific to Kubernetes, we'll take it a little, little later, just put it in the Q&A section. We'll address those as well if we have time, but Kubernetes related question and Docker related question, mm -hmm. we'll give that a priority. So Docker image history, uh, this image, let's say V1. How does this work? And uh, Docker image history v2, we'll figure out. Now you'll start seeing the difference. Version one of the image here, right, uh, has only one layer. You'll see these layers are common. All of these are common. Version one has one layer, version two has many layers. Now, what is the secret of getting these layers? And these layers are important because uh, this sets up the metadata. You exactly know what went into which layer and uh, you can then rebuild the image. You have the metadata. When you launch the container uh, using this image, you have everything configured, right? So like uh, the application, the board, um, the actual run command and so on will all be there. I'll show you the difference. So if I run this, Docker image or Docker run hyphen I D T. And do the V1 and V2. Let me show you what happened. This is the output of V1. Started running. Uh, I'll have to use one more option to actually access the application running on it as well. So V2 and V1. Okay, I'm just watching the last two. This is the one which was launched with V1. This is the one which was launched with V2. In terms of the ports, it's fine. It takes the port mapping and it does everything fine, no problem. But in terms of, uh, let's say, um, the application, what application to run, uh, and so on, it doesn't know about it because it does not have the right metadata defined, like you see here, uh, with this CMD instruction, the expose instruction, and uh, whatnot, right? And that's what is kind of missing uh, as part of this v V1 versus V2. And that is because of this difference, where V2 has all the metadata uh, that is required for that image. Uh, it has CMD exposed run. We look into this and it has the metadata like what application to launch, uh, what, you know, um, command to run and, uh, you know, what port to map and so on. Everything is well defined here and you can see what went into each layer as well. So how these layers are created, we will look into that. We will also look into how to write the Docker file after that here. Uh, are there any questions still here? So let's just do a checking quickly. And are there any specific questions still here? All right, I'm just gonna look at the Q&A section and address some of these here. Uh, only if you have questions put in there. So a uh, question from Bebbins is, uh, since we have ECS, ECS is the EC2 container service I'm assuming, which is simple to use. Uh, what is the main advantage of using Kubernetes? So ECS is one service by AWS. So AWS, if you look at it, it started with this container service called as ECS, their own orchestration engine, which is managed service. And what happened was initially there was no EKS. EKS is their EC2 Kubernetes, a managed Kubernetes service and their own orchestration service as well, which is ECS and EKS. Now, why people prefer using EKS or Kubernetes in general is because Kubernetes is much more sophisticated. It has many features which may not be part of ECS. ECS is also very specific to AWS versus Kubernetes is agnostic to the platform. You can set up Kubernetes on your local environment with any VM 
and use uh, I'm using a digital notion, so I'm going to show you set up Kubernetes, setting up Kubernetes on this cloud, and then you can take it on uh, AWS or Azure or anything else. Kubernetes becomes the platform, so it is agnostic to the cloud or the underlying platform, and it gives you the same features. And it is very very sophisticated. Also, if you look at the origin of Kubernetes, it is from Google, and uh, they have uh, they started building their own orchestration engine. Doesn't even know the name of the orchestration engine that Google created initially, and that Kubernetes is inspired from. Uh, so they started doing that, and they brought in all these features of handling things at Google scale into the Kubernetes, and that's why Kubernetes is the popular one. And it is it is like a platform which works anywhere else, uh, anywhere across uh, any cloud or data center or anything else, and that's why uh, people use Kubernetes. Okay, about the video sharing, yes, it will be shared. Recording will be shared to what? Um, All right, so there is a question from Pradeep. Uh, is web server running in V1 when you created the container? Uh, let's look at that. So what is running in here? Uh, I can look at it using Docker top and see what's running in V1. This is V1. And as you can see, it's just running SH. It is not running the application because it doesn't have the metadata to do so, like command here, right? And that's the difference between, you know, uh, launching a container uh, with image created manually versus with Docker file versus the one created with v2 this one has the right application it has the application running you can see it's running on that port and it's working fine right that's the difference now how does it work how did v2 have all these layers created as part of its image build process uh, let me explain that to you now and then we'll move on to understanding of Docker files as well. So how the image is created and the layers are created is you have a Docker file here, which has a set of instructions. We've seen that. So what, you, what happens is when you start building an image with it, uh, it takes this first instruction called as from. And using that from, yeah, it brings in all the layers from the base image. Those are the layers that you see here. Right, so this is the base image layers like Python and you know everything else related to that, and then it starts executing. So, what it does is it uses that base image and launches an intermediate container, and within that intermediate container, it starts running uh, you know all these instructions like work directory, for example. So, it did that automatically. Remember, when I created the image manually, that's what I did launch the container then i copied over the code and everything it's doing the same thing but in a different approach different approach because it creates this container executes one instruction and then commits it into a new intermediate image creating one more layer that's how this layer got created and then what happens is interesting because it deletes this container and launches a one launches a new one and it follows the same process so it commits that creates a new layer uh, if needed deletes it if not goes further and launches uh, or executes the next instruction in here and then it commits it into a layer and then deletes it if needed and then goes and uh, you know iteratively builds the layers on top of that that is how you got these many layers so that's the difference between v1 and v2. v2 keeps on adding these layers, one layer per instruction. And that's why if you look at the number of layers, you are going to see it matches one, two, three, four, five, six. And how many layers v2, uh, we created with v2, right? So let's look at the history. It's not six, but it is five because the layer called us from or the instruction called us from brought in the base image. And then it is work directly, copy, run, expose, CMD. Five instructions converted into five layers. And that's what this is, iterative image build, right? And uh, then 
let's talk about this whole docker file business right so how uh, docker files are written what are these instructions cmd expose run copy work directory but does everyone understand here how the iterative approach works how the layers are created it's an iterative approach as i just explained uh, with this one if, uh, if there are any questions here you can ask i'll uh, give you a few seconds to do so Okay, Devish has a question about um, how to build an image with Maven. Um, in the interest of time, I will not be able to show you right now, but you could look up the course that we have. It follows a Java application and builds the image using Maven itself and um, many other projects we have as part of that as well. All right, so that's what I would suggest. Uh, the process is same though, you just pull the Java application, run Maven compile or Maven package and be done with it, right? Um, in fact, I have a lab from that course I can show you, it's a similar process. So this is for a Java application. Right, so this is a Java application. You do the same thing. So clone, uh, this is a Spring Boot application. So you do the same thing, copy the code, get into the container. Instead of uh, where diff things differ is instead of pip and stop, you do maven package and commands related to that. And you run the application instead of uni using unicorn app uh, and to run the Java, you do that. And a Docker file for a Java application looks like this, where we have maven, uh, where we have, uh, let's say, uh, Java particular command. But if you look at the structure from work directory, copy, run, expose, CMD, uh, all of that looks very similar. So it's a similar structure. So what are these instructions? Uh, how do they work? Uh, that's what we will look at here. Right, so there's one more question it looks like from Arsalan. So all the other layers are built on the base layer and base layer is the one which came from the Docker file. No, uh, Docker file had no layers. Base layers, like if you look at the timestamp, you'll see it. So these base layers, where do they come from? This is from a base image. What is the base image here? Python Alpine 3.17. So this image was pulled as a result of from instruction. So the first instruction is from instruction that brought in all these layers. And on top of that, it kept on building. So this is the base image. Uh, this is taken from Docker registry. If you see this probably is present on my system, Docker image LS. And uh, sorry, yeah, this one. And uh, if I look at the doc history of that, image you are going to see the same thing it's basically all of these layers until this python 3 these layers are part of this image that's the base okay there's a question from emika about uh, what is the difference between a command and entry point now to understand this and um, many other uh, i'm gonna dive into the world of Docker files now. Then we look at each of the instructions. I'll just read one more question from Valerie uh, Asaf. So how do you manage this container in your registry in real time? Uh, registry does not contain a container registry as an image. So think of it as a template, a VM template versus the actual virtual machines. Virtual machine is a runtime instance of a template image is just a set of files so in the registry these are stored as just a set of files that's what it is all about right in the form of layers so they are organized in a certain way but just a set of files stored in the registry is what it is it's not a running container you when you launch it on your system that becomes a container it's not a container until you run it 
uh, lab page link will be shared. It's part of the curriculum anyway, so don't worry about it. I'll share it explicitly later. Let's talk about Docker file now and instructions. So what is a Docker file? It's a code which you can use to launch uh, uh, the build process and automate that. You can share it as well. It follows its own instructions and uh, syntax, and that's what you see here. Now, what are these instructions? Let's look at it quickly. The first instruction is from. From is the base. Right, define the base image, and it basically follows the same uh, structure. And you define an image like image has a registry, a repository, namespace, and a namespace, registry, namespace, repository, and a tag. So if all those four fields can be defined with from. This is an example of uh, from instruction from our Docker file. Right, we have Python and Python three point seven. This is the image. I will show you one more image, which is quite useful to learn about, that is MySQL. So if you want to learn how the Docker files are written, I would highly recommend you look at the MySQL image, which has a lot of these practices, including entry point and whatnot, right? So all of that is covered here. You see the from instruction here follows um, Oracle Linux Slim. So it's a version of Oracle uh, Linux. Oracle Linux is a distribution there. Uh, so it brings in the base from, that is. And then you have a set of instructions, like run instructions um, are the core of it. So what happens during the build time, whatever you want to do during the build time, let's say you want to compile an application, install the dependencies, uh, you know, do other things like are there any other steps which is needed, install you know, any packages or set up the users. So all of that is part of the run instruction, as you can see here as well, right? So this installing uh, the packages, you know, this is where it is doing something else as well. So I'm going to pick one more, uh, a Debian based version of uh, MySQL and explain with that. Yeah, similar, the slight difference is uh, it uses like Debian or Ubuntu like command, like MySQL is being installed. So these are the run instruction. However, a lot of times you see the run instruction, you know, defined this way. It's a block of run instruction, like one run block, multiple commands. One block, multiple commands. Uh, that is what it is, right? So one block and multiple commands is what you see uh, being done here. Now, why it is done this way is because uh, there are a couple of reasons. Number one is uh, there is a limit on the number of layers you can have because each instruction is going to convert it into a layer. We've seen that process. The you know process of creating the layers, right? It reads a layer, creates a container, executes it, then commits it. So for each instruction, there will be a layer. So if you have 100 instructions, if you create 100 run instructions for 100 commands, you will end up creating 100 odd layers, which is not only going to exhaust the number of layers quickly, <coughs> sorry, the total number of layers being 128 as max but more than that it also has an impact on the size of the image uh, how does it have an impact on the size of the image let's look at with an example so this is an example where we have a run instruction like this where what happens is we are downloading we're installing and we're deleting the downloader uh, file as well so how does that work is uh, we can go with two different approaches. One where we have a bunch of commands combined into uh, different run instructions. Second is one run instruction per command as well, right? So you can do it either ways. Let's say we have one command, one run per instruction for every command. Uh, so what will happen in this case is it will download, then commit it into a layer then it will install so it is extracting installing so you have a downloaded version you have an installed version then it commits it into a layer and then it goes and also uh, deletes it so it is going to get deleted it will not be visible uh, when you launch a container with it but it is been committed in some of the bottom layers right here so the file exists as a redundant file it is not used it is not visible but it still exists bloating your container image. So if you have too many run instruction, 
this is what is going to happen. It's a suboptimal image you will create. Versus if you have, let's say, uh, commands like this, uh, one run command with uh, multiple commands combined into it, then it leads to this situation where you have basically, um, you know, it does it in an optimal way. Whereas, okay, let me bring it back. Instead of doing it this way, you download, you install, you delete the downloader, and then you commit it into a layer. So just one layer instead of, let's say, three. And this is optimal because it only contains what is needed. And that's why you see these run commands being combined. Because if you look at this example, like this is where it is generating the package index. Uh, then it installs MySQL. Then it removes whatever is not needed. And only after that will it commit into one layer, basically. Right? So that's why run instructions are important. And uh, that is why uh, it is done in this way. Uh, is this clear? Are there any questions? If you have questions, you can put it in the Q&A. I'm also watching the chat a little bit here. Uh, Atul has a question about multi-stage Docker file. We'll come to that. Um, yeah, difference between run command entry point is what we are looking at now. So we're looking at run. So, uh, okay, Navraj has a question about can we use run instead of CMD? Uh, well, there is a different um, difference there, right? So run is for something else, CMD is for something else altogether, right? So we'll come to that. When we talk about CMD, I'll explain the difference between CMD and run. But if you want to do essentially anything during the build time, you have the run instruction for that, okay? Uh, we'll come to CMD. CMD defines the application to launch when you run the container. Uh, you'll realize, uh, realize the difference when we get there. Uh, next is work directory though. Work directory defines let's say a directory from where everything else runs. Like when you say run, you're not defining CD into anything. The reason for that is because we already defined it. When you say run this application, where is it running from? That's the work directory. Work directory gets created automatically and used in the subsequent instruction, run, copy, CMD, even the copy instruction when you're copying the code. Basically, where are you copying to? that's work directory or relative path to that. That's what it is, right? So work directory is important. Uh, two important commands are add and copy, similar commands actually. Mostly we use copy and we have this copy dot dot. What does that mean? Right, so copy dot and dot. What does this thing mean? So basically what we're copying from and copying to, uh, let me talk about that. So what are we doing here is we essentially using this build context, right? This is called as a build context. And we are copying from the build context and copying to the work directory here. So these are the relative parts. This is the build context, this is the work directory. Work directory we've seen it already. What is the build context? Build context is nothing but whatever you define as a path to the Docker file when you use Docker build command. So when you use Docker build command, this is the path to the Docker file. That's the build context. Build context is nothing but whatever is in the current directory here. So this gets copied to the Docker daemon during the build process. So when you try to build an image, you basically see <coughs> transferring the context, which is about very small here. Transferring the context is where it is copying all these files which exist on your workstation to the Docker daemon. And during the build time, you can copy from that path. And that is what you define here. So dot is like everything, start or start, all the files, right? But you can also selectively copy the files to uh, the you know uh, work directory or different process and all that as well, right? <clears throat> versus add. Uh, so what is the difference between copy and add then? So when you say copy dot dot, we are just copying the code. Why are we copying this is basically so that when we run pip install, the code should be available. Where are we running pip install from is slash app. 
the code should be available there. That's why we are copying first. And then we run this after that. So it gets executed sequentially always. Okay, you can also use add. Uh, what would happen if you use add? Add can accept the remote source. So this source can be a remote URL, like, like a downloaded artifact from Jenkins Artifactory somewhere. Uh, and it can be a zip file, these, uh, archive file. And if it is an archive, it will not only copy, but also extract at the destination, right? So that is the difference between copy and, uh, uh, you know, copy and uh, add, right? That's the difference. Now, uh, next instruction here is environment. We'll define some environment variables. So you can define the environment variables and use it subsequently. So instead of defining it multiple times, calling it multiple times, you just define it once and use it everywhere else. It is also available when you run the containers uh, with it. <coughs> That's about environment variables. Expose defines the port. So what port your application is going to run on? That is what is defined here. And that is what is used for something called as a port mapping later. So basically, you're letting your users know this, expect my application to run on this port and listen to this port only. Uh, so that when you want to access the application, it will be available to you. That's what you define with the expose instruction. That's about port mapping. Next is CMD. Now, this is where we come to the command or CMD. Now, you define, you see this command being defined here, like unicorn app colon app something for mysql you have just mysql d as a command uh, what is the difference between command and the rest of the run instruction is basically everything that you see with run is happening during the build time right so you have these commands and stuff so when you do the build this image build is happening whatever you want to execute here all of that is run instructions but let's say you have built it into an image you take that image and you launch it into a container. When you launch it into a container, what to start? What is the application? How do you launch it? What is the command to run? That is defined to you, CMD. There's only one thing that you need to run, that is CMD, is what defines here. So how do we define that? Is using CMD. And that's why you see typically one command running for an application. Uh, and that's why you see CMD being defined here. And that's the difference between command and run. This is during the build time. This is during the launch of the container. That is the command. Uh, is this clear? Also, sometimes you'll see multiple commands in the image layer. So you'll see, you know, in the images, you have multiple commands. Uh, what does that mean? So this is my image. It contains my command plus it has this command plus maybe some other command right here. Uh, what does this mean is because this image, my image was built using my base image, which was here. This base image had set Python 3 as the command. Okay, I'm going to allow Amos to speak. And this image was built using maybe Alpine Debian something and that has this command. That's why you see multiple commands uh, being defined right here, right? So that's why the reason for multiple commands. So is it clear uh, the difference between run, which is a build time versus command, which is a uh, launch time or execution time? Is that clear? Just type in clear if it is. I'm hoping you're still there. And I'm hoping that you're able to follow this along. Um, if it is getting too complex, do let me know as well. We'll try to simplify it or break it down next time. And if it is clear, uh, do type it in as well. Awesome. Yeah, that's good to know. Uh, all right. So if it is clear, that's great. Let's move on to the next part here. Uh, Okay, we were talking about command versus run. Now there is one more twist. That's why I asked you this question now. Because what is that twist is? There is something else apart from command. Similar to command though. 
uh, and it's called as an entry point, right? So a good question, a more valid or a closer question is what is the difference between command and entry point? Uh, entry point command are on one side during the launch time, the run is during the build time. That should be clear. Now, what is entry point? Let's look at it. To understand entry point, we need to go back to an example, right? So uh, basically it is something that you launch. So I said that you have the run instructions and those are used during the build process. When you launch a container, what application to launch, that is defined with command. And if you have an entry point though, this changes slightly and it will basically the control will go to the entry point and then later to the command. An entry point is where you have this initialization steps. Now, what is this for? Let's look at it with an example of MySQL. In MySQL, you see all, all this run instructions and you have this command CMD right here. And then you have something called as an entry point as well. Now, what happens here? is the control will go to entry point and from there optionally it will launch a command so what happens here if you want to understand it you need to understand and look into the entry point where does it come from where do we find it entry point was copied from where copy is typically relative to the build context build context is the same path as docker file so if you go to the path where docker file exists you will also find the entry point that's where it is All right, and here <coughs> you see a bunch of things happening. Amongst these, some of the important parts include, uh, let's say setting up the root password. So what is happening here is when you launch the container, it launches the entry point first. Why? Uh, the reason for that is, you want to do some steps. You don't want to hard code the password into the image, for example. Password should not be part of the image at all. You want to make it part of the uh, launch process. But it's not a command. Command is just one command like MySQL. So what happens in between is where you need to have a way to do some initialization. That's what the entry points are for, where you can do things like, oh, I want to set up that with password. I want to create more users initialize databases, you know, set up some grants or permissions, all of these steps I want to perform before launching the command. That's what the purpose of entry point is. And you can see that clearly here, that's what is happening. You see the, uh, you know, uh, it's creating the setting of the password. It is creating some users maybe. <coughs> It is setting up the grants, right? And it is doing everything else uh, right here. And that's what is happening. And then it says exec dollar at the rate, meaning the dollar at the rate, some of you might have figured, what is this dollar at the rate? It is a set of arguments, meaning whatever you define as command, this entire thing is being provided as a set of argument. This is dollar one argument number one, dollar two, dollar, argument number two, and number three, and number four. So when you say dollar at the rate, mean, meaning all the arguments, so this entire thing I want to be running at, at the end of it, meaning I'm just completing everything in entry point and then calling the command. Whatever is part of a command, you're calling it. So what is the best, I mean, this is a debatable topic. Sometimes you see the application itself being launched with entry point, however, as part of the best practice, I always recommend use the command always and then use entry point only when you want to do the initialization and then pass the control to command. That's when this makes more sense. And that's what you see here. So, right. So uh, look at the MySQL example for the clarity here. Is it clear? Um, just type in clear. Uh, too much to consume for Sahada. I think you'll have to take it a step by step uh, thing. 
and I'll tell you how to get started with a simpler approach and what are the topics to get started with before coming here. Because yes, we are trying to uh, cover the topics which might be advanced level if you're completely new to container, which is not starting with the foundation of containers right now. All right. Okay, if it is clear, let's move on to the next topic. Uh, next instructions are a few more, right? So you have volume. So if you define volume, for example, what happens is, let's say for a database, you need to store the data in a persistent storage. That's what a volume is. And uh, you don't want the data to be deleted even if the container is gone. And that's what it does. It allows, I mean, it automatically creates a volume and mounts it inside the container. So whatever data you're writing from the database, it is going to the volume. And from there, it will basically, even if you delete the container, the volume will exist. You can launch the new version of the container, connect to the same volume. You can consume the data. So data remains persistent with the volume. If you want to do that, especially for the databases, this instruction is necessary. User is basically for security uh, major, like you want to run your application within a container as a non root user, typically, that's a good idea. Right? don't run it as a root user. A lot of times we just continue like in this case, this application is running as a root user. I'll show you what I mean by that. So if I go inside the container, it is running as a root user. This is not a good idea. So what you should do is switch to a non root user. And that is what this instruction allows you to do. You will have to create the user before I will share an example uh, a little later, right? But that's the core instructions in the Docker file. And you can see a Docker file. Uh, which looks like this. Sometimes uh, a Docker file looks slightly different, right? I'll show you an example of that. Before that, let's think about what all is there as part of this image, right? So when we build this image, it is about uh, Sorry, 70 odd MBs. I'll show you another image. I'll create an image for an application. Uh, generally, I use it as an exercise as part of my trainings as well. This application called as Facebook. Uh, it's application written in C right now. I'll write a Docker file or create a Docker file for it as well and show you how I would build it. Now this is the application written in C and if I have to build it, I will, let's say I can use Ubuntu as a base image, uh, install these packages like this, build it like this and launch it like this. It's a web application as well. And I can modify this or convert it into a Docker file as well, uh, which I will show you with an example, a simple Docker file for a Facebook application. Let's assume that I've written the Docker file for this application, which uh, does the same thing that I just explained to you, right? So it starts with the base, which is the vanilla version of Ubuntu, defines the work directory, copies the code from where, from wherever I'm running it from. It has the code, so that's why it is important to put the code in the same path where the Docker file is. Then we install the dependencies, run make all, define which port application runs on, define how the application runs, and let it build. <coughs> okay. Right. 
Okay. Now this application is being packaged. This is the C application. It is being compiled uh, on Ubuntu system. And uh, at the end of it, I'm going to get a package with uh, application running and so on. It will be created with Ubuntu. It would have source code copied. So you see the source code is being copied into the image. Uh, application is running here. The build tools remain as part of the image. Remember that. We'll come to that in a, in a moment. Let me show you the image. Let me show you if it runs. Okay. And uh, Docker run hyphen IDT capital B. Okay. I'm launching the application. It's about 400 MB worth of an image. It is running, sure. And it's running on this port 32771. So let me access it. Yeah, it's running and it's the best social network you've never heard of. It's just a clone, but uh, uh, it's a good application to exercise with. <clears throat> now, the application is up, but there are certain things which should not be part of that image. It is there right now. I have mentioned about it. This image is about 404 MB. I want you to think about what are the things which are not needed. There are at least two things. And then I will show you how you can optimize it. And that's where we'll apply the techniques. We'll talk about multi-stage Docker file. We'll also talk about the uh, use of really tiny operating systems like distributions like Alpine and what is the purpose of using it, right? So I'll talk about that um, in a few minutes. But think about at least two things which should not be there and put it in the chat if you uh, have figured it out already. All right, I'm going to take some questions. I'm also going to extend an offer for the membership. I'll talk about that in case if you're interested. In the meanwhile, and once I'm done talking about it, I'll show you how to optimize this and we'll go on for like 20 more minutes or so as well. Okay, I'll uh, look at the questions first. So uh, the question from Samuel is, is the volume inside the container or the host? Not inside the container. If you had it inside the container, the moment you deleted the container, the volume would be gone. And we are talking about volume instruction that I explained earlier. Uh, so in case of volume instruction, the volume is on the host or it could be a network volume depending on where it is created and how. Uh, how are the user maps between OS and Docker? Very good question, Navraj. So by default, there is a one as to one mapping. If you create a root user inside a container, that has a mapping to the root user. Uh, so zero user is zero user mapping on the host. That can be the tricky thing. That can be the source of problem. So how do we fix it? Or how do we create a mapping where uh, it's not like zero user should be mapped to a non-root user on the host is using something called as the user namespace. So user namespace, you have to install and configure separately. Uh, and if you do that, it will basically create a different mapping. Just to understand this, little better. Uh, let me talk about how this works. So in terms of user, in, this is the host. There's a root user with user ID zero. There's X user. There is Y user and so on. And inside the container, if you are running something with root, it has a zero user ID. It is mapped to zero. This is a concern. And if you enable the root names, uh, user namespace, what happens is there are anonymous users like 35x, you know, 35,535. And this is a user called as nobody with very little permissions. So when you enable user namespace, this basically switches to a mapping like this. So it will be mapped to a non root, you know, like, like a very less privileged user. That is the, uh, that is what happens when you enable user namespace. All right, it is going to take time to understand because uh, I'll show you, I'll share with you how you can take a go step by step instead of just digesting, trying to digest everything at the same time. Because during these master classes, we are going at a little bit of a depth. So you'll have to build that foundation a little bit. Uh, 
Okay. Files not part of the code. Yes, Docker file is supposed to be added. Uh, you'll have to add the Docker file to the code if you're talking about the lab guide. That is, <clears throat> you'll have to create a Docker file with the content given here. Uh, the lab guides you will find it here. This curriculum I've shared it. Let me share it. Share it one more time. Should be yeah. Should be there. I shared uh, with you. So if you look at the file section, you might see it there. Uh, if you look at the curriculum, you will find today's lab guide right here. Let me share that with you on the chat as well so that you have access to it. Okay, I've shared the lab guide, just the lab guide now. So you have access to it as well. And if you look at that lab guide, uh, when you clone this code, you don't have the Docker file because you're supposed to add it later. Um, that's part of the exercise actually. So you will see that here, take the content, create a Docker file, and then move on with, uh, with that. Right? That's what you should be doing. <coughs> All right. Now, in case if you want to take it to the next level, so you already have access to the live sessions, the recordings, you have access to the lab guides I've just shared with you. Uh, what would be the next step for you is if you want to complete the project, get access to the courses, build this foundation uh, with the courses, you can also go for the membership. What is the membership? The paid membership is the geek membership that we have. The initial level of the membership, you can find it on schoolofdevops.com slash membership as well. And what do you get access to that from the point of view of Kubernetes Bootcamp, you get access to the courses. There are a couple of courses, very detailed courses on Docker and Kubernetes, which takes you from very beginning, like what is container, what is Docker, how do you launch containers, how do you operate those, how do you build images, what is Docker Compose, which we're not going to talk about it today because we have limited time, but it is all there as part of that course. Let me show you the course as well. And then Kubernetes is a very, very detailed course. Um, you will find it here. So this is our membership platform. Uh, if you are, once you become a member, you, when you log in, this is what you will see. We have uh, this dashboard. This dashboard is typically what you see when you log in. And uh, this is where you can keep track of the courses. You can set your missions. You can see this Kubernetes dojo with all these missions uh, is here. And as you complete the missions, you will get these badges and some certifications associated with that as well. In terms of the courses, uh, with this level of membership, the initial level of membership that I'm talking about, it has access to the Docker course, Kubernetes course, 20 plus projects that we're building right now. Uh, you will be part of the groups that, uh, you know, you will be building things together. And we've started doing that from this quarter. Uh, you have access to the coaching, which is different than this training session. We have the coaching live coaching sessions on Zoom, which is more interactive you can ask questions you can get doubt solved um, you can get guidance and we have weekly sessions and you'll have access to that forever because i'm giving you access to the lifetime membership today and from there you also have access to these certifications so you earn those badges with the weekly tasks and then we have a couple of certifications uh, even if you don't apply or go for ck ckd if you complete the projects complete the courses uh, do the learning, uh, have the capabilities, we will uh, also offer that certification that is part of the membership. Now, what are the courses which are part of this membership? There is mainly Docker, Kubernetes, and then there are a few more, right? If you just look at the Docker and Kubernetes course, let me just dive into that uh, itself. <clears throat> so that's part of our... Right, so this Docker uh, Bootcamp is uh, actually a course I created for Linux Foundation. It is called as LMD254 on Linux Foundation, but I just converted it to Docker because it is Docker plus a few more topics. So right from uh, introduction to open container ecosystem, what is Docker, what are the technologies under the hood, how do you run and operate the containers. Uh, this is a very detailed course. 
uh, how do you build images, everything that I explained in depth uh, with like step-by-step -step approach, how do you uh, build the images, what are the instructions, what is the significance of each of this instruction, there is a project there about that Facebook app, uh, right in there. And uh, there's the different project library as well, which are building for CK and CKID. And then uh, how do you do advanced image building, like multi-stage Docker file, I'm gonna talk about that. Uh, alternatives to Docker, like Podman, Builda, Scopio, uh, those kind of things. Uh, what is, um, how do you get started with Compose, container networking and storage, uh, Docker Compose. This is the Docker course, you have access to that. Uh, you will also have access to the Kubernetes course, which is even more in depth, has many additional lessons. And uh, this is a this is just a Docker course that we are talking about. I'm covering part of it, and uh, then there is a Kubernetes bootcamp, which <clears throat> is going to be converted into CKA CKD bootcamp. It's almost there, and here you learn everything right from introduction to Kubernetes, uh, path to automation, setting up the environments. You know, and then we go on to talk about um, pods, replica sets, load balancers, application deployments. Uh, we talk about configuration management, uh, volumes and stuff like that. All of this is part of that paid membership uh, along with the projects. There'll be 20 plus projects on CK, CKD. You'll be working on groups over the next three months and you can participate in these groups and these workshops as many times as you want once you are a member. And if you want to join this membership, uh, let me give you that offer as well. So this, you know, if you look at the list price and you have access to the community, uh, we are building a community on Discord and also on our platform. Uh, we have these challenges, including this 90 day challenge uh, for Kubernetes. And the list price for this is $199, or about 16,000 Indian rupees. And uh, we, I'm going to extend a webinar offer over the email as well for a couple of days, uh, limited um, quantity. So about 50 members, we're going to extend this offer. But if you take this offer right now, uh, this is a lifetime offer. There is also a yearly price and you can check out the price on our page. And if you just prefer the yearly access, just one year access, you just go for that. But if you want to take this lifetime membership where you get access to the coaching life coaching is like forever and it's not just about kubernetes that we talk about um, you can see guidance on any devops topic we bring in web, uh, we're bringing in the monthly webinars uh, we have all these live sessions that you have access to <clears throat> and it's a kind of a lifelong learning opportunity that you'll get access to with this right and if you want to take this offer <clears throat> I'm gonna make it available only for the next 15 minutes. And you should be able to see that at this price, uh, which would be available only for the next 15 minutes. So you know, publishing this offer and it will be available to you for the next 15 minutes at the cost of $79 or so around 6,000 Indian rupees, including taxes. So 4999 plus taxes. And uh, uh, we also have adjusted this to the PPP ratio, the purchase power parity. So just check out the offer. If you click on that, uh, you may see uh, a price which is in your local currency, which is much lower than this because we have adjusted based on uh, where you come from and we want to you know, really cater to the global audience and make sure that it is fair price for everyone, right? So you'll see the offer there. If you are from India and if you want more uh, options in terms of payment, we have another gateway. I'll share an offer with that gateway as well so that you have access to it. And uh, it is better to use the Razor payment, uh, Razor Pay gateway if you are in India. And it's a slightly lower price um, there. It's 499 plus 18% tax or something. So I've shared that in the chat. So if you are from India, uh, you can get that offer. <clears throat> and this will be valid. Uh, for the next 15 minutes only, this offer, we're gonna be closing the session. After that, it should be gone, right? So we have about 15 minutes to go from now. Um, two hours is the webinar, just a slot that we have. It will not be extended beyond that. So I'll just talk about um, the multi-stage Docker file very closely. Do we have Azure DevOps? We have Azure um, 
slight bit of Azure DevOps and a container for Windows for .NET application. In fact, I'll include that as part of this membership itself. So um, I think that would be a good idea. So uh, it is there about uh, how do you build containers on Windows and for .NET applications and publish it on uh, Azure as well. All right, how long will be tonight's lesson? So it will be done in next 15 minutes. We have a hard limit on that. Uh, the offer will run for the next 12 minutes. So if you want to get this offer, uh, like a one-time deal, it's a lifetime offer for that membership, uh, the initial level of membership, this is a good time to do so. Okay, uh, I'll take questions if there are any, and I'll take uh, talk about this multi-stage Docker file very quickly. Okay, uh, there is a question. Uh, please explain app colon app. Uh, that's specific to the application, which is a Python application. The way you run applications with Python, I'm looking at this basically. Uh, vote app here. The way you launch <clears throat> a unicorn app is by call, calling a particular file and a class in that. And that's the Python uh, Python's unicorn's way of launching this application, right? It doesn't have to be this for any other application. This is the unicorn Python application that you launch it uh, with Python Flask. Uh, another question, very good question from Sandun is, uh, do we have order in the Dockerfile instruction? Yes, Dockerfile instructions are executed in sequence in that order. So it is very important to maintain it. So if you copy the, if you move this copy instruction after run, it will not work because if you don't have the source code, this will not run, right? So sequence ordering is extremely important. Uh, on the CMD command, there's a question from Lewis, CMD command, why are you re-specifying the vote 80 after using expose? Okay, after expose, this is specifically the way you launch, launch application. It doesn't have to be as part of the CMD at all. Again, this is a very specific example for this application and that application needs that um, you know, need, needs the port method to be defined or the, it's called as a bind. Uh, so what do you bind it to? You define it there. Here we're not binding. Uh, with MySQL, I showed you, uh, we're not using anything in command related to port, which is defining the port separately. So it is specific or subjective to the application in this case. Okay, so there's a, one more question from Hussein about in case if I added expose 8080, should I put minus p uh, in the run command? Okay, no, uh, again, it goes back to the same question. You don't have to define the port in here in the command. It's not necessity unless the application needs it. That should answer that question. Uh, there's one more question from Agassi. Uh, is this session being recorded? Yes, it is. Um, I think I explained it in the context very beginning, but it is being recorded. Basic questions, uh, you're running all of this in a local Linux machine or a VM on the cloud. It's a VM on the cloud. It's running on DigitalOcean. I use DigitalOcean Cloud, and this is the exact VM I have created today uh, to run this with. So it is a VM on the cloud, but you can run it on your local machine using Docker desktop, or if you have a Linux machine, directly you can install it. Okay, Selva has a question. Selva has a, had that question. Michelle has a question. Is the product of the week uh, still available? Yes, it is. I will uh, send out an email with product of the week uh, and we'll talk about it on our Thursday in a circle call, uh, which is the members call. Atul has a question. Can we run container inside the container? Uh, well, you can. Uh, there is a product called as um, DIND, Docker Inside Docker that allows you to treat docker host as a um, container as a docker host but that's a very specific and specialized use case typically you run a container and you can't go and run container within it unless you are using that doc specific image called as dind with that you can do it but it's not a uh, it's not a common use case how about uh, not offer? Can you put them also so we can plan accordingly? Sure. So generally, if you are a Geek member, we have an upgrade offer. So whatever you're paying here right now, it is not gone. It is considered and factored into that when we upgrade from Geek to Nerd. So you can safely go for Geek and also upgrade to Nerd later. Generally, I talk about that at a later stage because 
I don't want to overwhelm you with everything. We are focused on Kubernetes uh, masterclass here and Kubernetes uh, related thing. So I just explained that. And if you look, if you take Docker and Kubernetes course, you will easily spend three months with it. So after that, if you want to upgrade to that, we have a path to do that with all this cost factored in. Right again, the same question from Chana. Um, so it's about that. Uh, there are some questions on the chat. It looks like uh, Vivek has a question. What are two unused things imported in base image? One. Okay, uh, perfect. Let's come to that and I'll explain that and we'll close it in the next nine minutes. So what are the two things which shouldn't be there but are there in the image? One is the source code, right? So let me talk about that. One is the source code, right? Which is already part of it. So what we have right now is uh, with this image, we have the build tools like Python, pip, uh, on the dependencies. In case of that Facebook application specifically, that's why I built that application. Lot of build tools like compilers, make, uh, there's all these dependencies related to compilers and all that, right? So there's like 200 MBs of just build tools out there, uh, which are part of it. Um, then the source. So if I show you that, uh, this is where I switch to Facebook. All right, and that's where we have all the build essential. All this jazz is not needed. Uh, what else? Source code. Source code shouldn't be there at all. What we need is just a runtime and app. How do we achieve this is where we it leads us to something called as a multi-stage Docker file. This is the you know, the most important techniques when you want to optimize the Docker files. And what happens with multi stages, you have multiple stages instead of just one. Let me show you how a multi stage Docker file would look like for the same application. So I'm using two techniques here. Okay, let me first get the multi stage Docker file for it. What is the Docker file for the same application? What makes up a multiple stage? So you see from instruction, again from instruction, that means it's a second stage, beginning of the second stage. If you look at this, what happens here and what is going on with multi-stage? Why do we need it is because uh, with every stage, so you have one purpose, right? So you basically create different images with every single stage here. Uh, this is stage number one, stage number two. Right? This is called as build, this is called as run. What is the purpose of this? Uh, this is where we have the base image. In this case, Alpine, install the build tools, copy the source code and build it, we call. And then here, we just take what we need from this image, right? So essentially, with the first one, we have the source code, the build tools, and the application compiled here as a result of we call. Uh, or something equivalent to that. And then we start with the second stage where we say, okay, I just want what I need. Like in this case, just Alpine. Uh, just a vanilla version of Alpine will do, but we put it, we start again here and we only copy what we need, right? And then we launch it, okay? We only copy what we need specifically and then we just define how to launch it, the application. So if you look at the second stage, what's happening is we just have the runtime, just the dependency in the runtime that is needed uh, here. And we copy explicitly the application built here. So the source code remains here. The build tools remain here. This is a different image, this is a different image. This has only the runtime. And let's say this is the application copied from that first image. So how are we doing that is uh, um, we are copying from build, build is this. So we're only copying the application binary and anything else that is needed. And as a result of this, okay, I'm building an image. Facebook V2, 
But this time I will say I want you to use this Docker file, which is the multi-stage Docker file. If you don't have a Docker file with the name Docker file, you have to explicitly mention it. And what happens now, you'll see the difference. It started with that first stage where it is building it now until make all. Then it will keep that image aside, start again with Alpine and then only copy what is needed. So in this case, there is no source code being copied. There is no, um, you know, there are no build tools at all. It has that binary which is built along with the static and templates and that's it. That's all it has. And you see the difference now. And the other thing is we moved away from Ubuntu to Alpine. So we came down from 404 MBs to just about 9 MBs. So why? Because and how? Because it only has what we need, just the Alpine and just the binary and static and templates and that's all to serve the pages. And this is a working image. You can see that Docker image or Docker run hyphen IDTP. Okay. So it is not only tiny, it is more secure, it is optimized and it is working image because I can show you 32772, it should, if it comes up on 32772, it is working, right? So that's how you create optimized versions of the images uh, using this concept of multi-stage Docker files, which allows it, and, and a combination of that along with like tiny footprint images, which is the key to create optimized versions of the images, right? Also, you can use, um, I think I am gonna share one more thing here. I've created some chat GPT prompts. So if, even if you have a free version of the chat GPT, if you want to create a Docker file, right? You can just use the prompts like this to generate the code, go to chat GPT. Uh, let's say, if you want to implement all these best practices and create I'll go to the free version of GPD. So, and if you have, uh, so you can actually start using AI, right? So, uh, to supercharge your, you know, <clears throat> learning, and you can go to Chat GPD, uh, plug in this prompt, and say, I want to create a Docker file for a Python uh, Flask app. Assume defaults and it will give you uh, the Docker file with all the best practices in mind, right? So it has the instructions, it is doing the right thing here, combining all this, uh, multi-stage Docker file, right? Not just one, one stage, but sec two, sec two stage Docker file here. It also creates the users and switches to that. It has the health check. So all these best practices are already incorporated into it. If you use this prompt, so I've shared the uh, file which has my prompt for it uh, and you can try using that as well. And we may have to close this session. I don't like this actually, uh, this time constraint. Uh, I would have loved to go for maybe half, half an hour more at least, but due to that time constraint, we'll have to wrap it up now. Uh, do let me know and share the feedback over email about this session. Um, if you like something about it, if you did not like something about it, how we can improve it, uh, what can we do better next time, was there audio issue, uh, so all these kind of things, you do let me know. Uh, the offer is also gone um, now, so um, uh, I'll share another webinar offer. If you're interested in doing that, that can also be something that you can consider taking it up. Uh, Shenna has a question, I'm going to allow you to speak until the session goes on, but otherwise we're gonna close the session here. Those of you who are member, do join our Inner Circle call. I will send out an email tomorrow with the projects as well, but you get started with this. You get started with the Docker course and Kubernetes, and then I'll put all of that into the, um, into the weekly task for you as well, right? So if anyone wants to speak, Divish has a, um, wants to speak, you can. I'm enabling you to speak in case.
Okay, Divish says just signed up but do not see Docker nor Kubernetes course under my ID. Uh, just send out an email to support dot uh, at schoolofdevs dot com, um, and um, 